Hi there, welcome back to another episode of the Mind Your Liberty podcast. Today is March 19th, 2023. I'm Andrew, your host, and I'm excited about the conversation I've got for you today. Continuing on in our goal this year of having conversations that I just wanted to have that I think will be beneficial to the audience. Last year, if you're just picking up, last year I went through a lot of historical documents from the American founding era, and I really dove into education and my personal study, and this year I'm continuing that in some of these conversations, and so a lot of these conversations are going to have a bent towards education. I have uh, been involved in homeschooling my own family, a lot less so than my wife. I've got to give her credit. She does most of that. So I was homeschooled, my wife was homeschooled, but when it came time to school our own children, we both were kind of at a loss, and we really were looking for, we didn't know it at the time, but what was classical conversations, where we had the Christian community. I knew less about the classical model, which we'll hear about in our conversation today, but I knew I needed the structure and the community offered with classical conversations, but the flexibility of still, you're your children's teacher. And so we'll hear some more about that in the conversation today. I remember I had gotten to talk briefly at various different times with the Pierces. Hadn't really gotten to sit down and hear their whole story all at once. So I was excited to get to do that today. We'll hear a little bit of that and also some more about what Classical Conversations is. Again, this is the Mind Your Liberty podcast, so I try and I will try and keep the topics of the conversations tied into liberty in somehow. But I think really as I'm learning and everything... Everything connects. There's nothing that is just off in a universe all by itself. Everything in this life is connected, and everything can really tie into liberty. And I think we'll hear more about that in the conversation, too. I'm excited for you guys to get to listen. Without further ado, I'll jump on into the conversation. All right, so here we are with uh, Fred and Renee Pierce, friends of mine. And Renee was, she's the biggest ambassador for homeschooling I can think of. And She was who led me into uh, Classical Conversations, which I'm directing that uh, Foundations and Essential program now over the last few months. And Renee and Fred are largely responsible for that. So say hi, Fred and Renee. Hey. Hi. (laughs) So I, first of all, want to thank you guys for your time. I know you guys are busy. Thanks for uh, doing an episode here on the Mind Your Liberty podcast. So I... You guys have such a neat story for your family, and I just thought it was an inspiration to me, and I thought uh, others who are thinking about homeschooling or who are thinking about that in the future could benefit from a conversation, and so that's, that's where we're at. So I'd love to hear a bit about you guys and for the audience to hear uh, how you guys got to where you're at today in regards to homeschooling. Good. Are you ready? <laughs> yes. Um, okay. So we kind of decided ahead of time, like which part of the story was who. So I'm going to start <laughs> so we don't talk over each other. Um, I think there's a few like pivotal things that led us to where we were. Um, I think the earliest thing was as a 16 year old in high school, in public high school, um, I had a job, I had a car, I paid my own bills. But yet inside the institution of that high school, I had no voice. Um, I remember asking to take some, like, can I take this class? No, we have you on this track. And so I just remember being irritated by that. And then feeling like I remember sitting in my history class, just staring out the window, thinking, this is the dumbest waste of time for a kid. Like, (laughs) what are we doing? And I, it's so weird, but I still remember thinking, I won't make my kids do anything that looks like this. Like I'll find another way. So, so that was like a really early thing. It kind of flashes back in my head every now and then like, Oh yeah, I kind of knew this, this would be different for our family. Um, and then fast forward several years. Um, we, we participated in parents as teachers when our kids were little, um, when Brisa was born. And so they send this parent educator to your house and um, their tagline is parents and caregivers are their children's first and most influential teachers. So for five years, this lady came to my house every month and taught me how to teach my child every next milestone. And every time was like, you can do this. You're the best teacher. And so when it came time for kindergarten, she's like, you're going to put her in school. Let's get her registered. And I was like, 
Well, you've been telling me for five years. <laughs> I couldn't teach right? my kid. Um, and so, you know, those kind of things um, just started piling up. I am, you know, I am a little bit more natural leader and go getter. And so I don't, I don't have to wait for people to give me something. It's just like, no, we're going to do something different. And I don't think a lot of parents step into homeschooling feeling like, oh, we're going to do something different. And I was like, we're not doing that. So <laughs> there wasn't ever really like this scary apprehension of like, how will we figure it out? I just, I just knew it, it, we weren't going to do that. We had to find something else. So um, kind of launched us into homeschooling, I think. Any other thoughts? Yeah, so one of the big identifiers for us, too, was uh, Macy, our oldest daughter, um, whenever she was in that public education, right, like uh, we had adopted her at an older age. And so she kind of came to us and was already in a public school. Mm -hmm. uh, and as she was going through it, we realized that she had never really developed the foundational uh, concepts that she needed to to be able to progress. However, as she continued through that public education system, they continue to pass her along, even though she didn't grasp those concepts. So there were a lot of pieces that she was missing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a common story with with public school. You hear that a lot. Yeah. And so we saw that. And again, that coupled with uh, Renee's parents as teachers um, experience and encouragement, really, we thought there's there's a better way. And so we stepped out on faith, uh, which is really what it was, was faith, and said, okay, we're going to give this a go. And and so we started going through curriculums. I kind of laugh because I went to, um, I found some people doing different things and I went to different people's houses and, and like, just to see how they, how does it look in their house? And I remember like one family, they literally stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance and they sit down at their little individual desks. Um, and I tried that for a very, very short <laughs> period until I realized that's not quite it either. So it was interesting as we like tried out different styles and, you know, different things like that. So, yeah. And for me, it was definitely a lot different. Uh, having grown up in the public education system, when we decided to homeschool, I was expecting, okay, the kids are going to be up at uh, seven o'clock in the morning. They're going to eat their breakfast. They're going to sit at the table they're gonna do their schoolwork. Then there's going to be lunch. Like wait, I had these. Wait, like, they're going to do every page of every book of every chapter. I'm like, we don't need to do that page. And he's like, you have to do all the pages. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, we don't. <laughs> but that's what had been modeled for me. So it was a little bit of a shocker, you know. Uh-huh. So uh, how long how long t did it take you, Fred, to kind of find out that that wasn't necessarily the way it had to look? Uh, we were probably two years, three years in before I started letting that go. <clears throat> so it was it took a little while. It really did. Um, not from lack of effort or anything like that. It was just breaking the system that had been built into us from the time we were children, right? Because we didn't know any better. We weren't, we weren't educated at home. Uh, we went through the, the modern education system. And so the getting that to change, it took a little bit. Not for me. <laughs> it was a point of contention. <laughs> we had a lot of good discussions along the way. Yeah. Yes. It'll grow you for sure. Yeah. So so you guys just felt like that was that was what was for your family. You never never really had any questions. Yeah. I mean, and it, you know, it really wasn't even I mean, he said we'd stepped out in faith. We did. But it wasn't even really like a conviction that that it was just more of a passion of these are our kids. And we waited for kids for a little while. I mean, it took us a little while. So, I mean, it wasn't even like. Um, it wasn't a spiritual conviction, I guess is what I should say, to do that. It was just like the natural thing to do in the past, like, because I couldn't wait to have kids, like, why would I send them to school? <laughs> I, you know, all I ever wanted was to have kids. And so I enjoyed um, being, I enjoy, I like my kids. I enjoy, I know a lot of people say I couldn't spend all day with my kids, but I like spending time with, I like, they're cool people. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's beautiful that you're able to say that. It's great. Yeah. <clears throat> so 
how did you guys come up, happen upon classical conversations? Um, so I don't know. I feel like there's some bridges that need to be connected there from where we started. So Go I ahead. homeschooling maybe when I was 23. So really the year Brisa was born, I started homeschooling Macy. So it was kind of a weird, um, and I, I remember asking God along those ways, like, why would I be doing this when I'm still figuring out how to be an adult myself, right? <laughs> Off we went. So there was a lot of trial and error. We did um, a box curriculum. We did the video curriculum. Um, but the problem was, is those were those were in a box. And when you have a kid that came out of public school that didn't fit in the box, that's why we're not in the box. <laughs> why would you buy another box to do at home? Do you know what I mean? It just didn't it didn't work. So um, some of those are good curriculums. If you want that sort of checklist, I don't know, school at home experience. Uh -huh. But um, I, the, I guess I wasn't drawn to classical conversations so much as I was drawn to classical education. Okay. And classical conversations was sort of a facilitator or a mode to get that done. Um, I had two friends who talked a lot about their classical education experiences. One of them had kids in school. They went like three days a week, something. And I, and I just loved when they talked about it. I'm like, it just sounds great. You know, it's better than just doing these worksheets that we're doing. Um, and then my other friend, you know, kind of similar thing, kept telling me about it. So when we got to, to St. Joe, when we moved here, um, I mean, there's still nothing. And this one year I had kind of decided maybe we should go check out the classical school. It's a 45 minute drive, but I had driven more. I mean, we're very mobile people, so that wasn't terrible. Um, and so I was really just on the cusp of going, of compromising on my love of being with my kids for a classical experience, if that makes, I was just weighing those. Um, and somehow classical conversations came across my path. And that seemed to be a good solution one day a week um, with peers with a classical model, but I didn't have to forfeit all that time with my kids. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, we kind of stumbled on it. <clears throat> and can then, I, yeah, can I, can I interject there for a second? If <laughs> some of, some of my listeners may not understand what you're referring to when you say classical education, even um, I know I didn't when I first was introduced to all this stuff. Can you give us, is it possible to give us a quick definition of classical education? I can't do it quick. No, <laughs> <laughs> I've been wrestling with this a lot this week um, because we're getting ready to graduate Brisa out of, you know, she did classical for eight years. And it, and it just when you think you really understand it, oh, it's, it's these three stages. You, I mean, it just blows you away. It's so, it's so different. And coming her coming to the end of her, you know, primary education. I, I mean, literally this week, I was like, I wish I had something really profound to share with Andrew. <laughs> like, I wish I had. And I'm like, I'm just stuttering because I'm wrestling with what it's not. It's nothing. I don't know. Can you can you <laughs> can you sum it up? Because sure. I can't. <clears throat> um, okay. So a classical education basically takes the same building blocks that we use as kids, right? When you're a baby uh, and as you learn to crawl, you take those baby steps and get there, right? And then as soon as they're to that part, we're able to start teaching them uh, to speak. And nobody learns how to speak right away. You learn through doing it. Um, and essentially, that's what we're walking through is what we would call the grammar stage, where they're learning uh, the different sounds. So like a lot of the times kids, their first words will be mama or dada, right? Because that's yeah. what they're hearing. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what they're hearing. Uh, and they're mimicking you. They're learning what that is. They're associating uh, dada with that individual's face, their recognition, right? And then as they continue to grow, you teach them more and you start singing the alphabet to them. And they learn what the ABCs are. They can say them in order. And then you start putting sounds to each of those letters. From there, you can start forming words and you can go from there. You go all the way through that grammar stage and then you hit the dialectic where they can start building on that, forming more complex sentences. Mm -hmm. uh, 
not using just uh, the generic terms. And then eventually you uh, make your way to the rhetorician stage to where now you can create and explain to others how to do the same thing. So a good example would be like Michael, um, who has been a talker since he was a baby, right? Um, he's finally to the point now where he has a pretty extensive vocabulary that when he's speaking with other kids, he'll often use terms or, or words that they're not familiar with. And he can explain to them what the word is, what it means and use it in a proper context. So he's able to learn the material, uh, digest it, and then be able to pass it on to others. <laughs> and the really great thing about, uh, the classical education is it's not just, a you say, I say, <clears throat> type situation, right? We use something called the Socratic dialogue. And that's one of the things that is different, I would say, than what's occurred in uh, the education that I am the most familiar with, mm -hmm. uh, where you teach to a test and you regurgitate information. Utilizing the Socratic dialogue, we use questions to bring the individual to where they need to be. It's the same thing that Socrates, Plato, uh, ancient learners, the philosophers, yeah. the great thinkers using their method. Jesus, Jesus too, in a lot of cases. Oh, yeah, I yeah. love that. I, okay, so if I could just add like a couple phrases that attach to classical education. Um, well, they say classical education is a leadership education because you're not taught to obey, you're taught to lead. So instead of, instead of, like he said, regurgitating, you have your own thoughts and your own, and you have the skills to just step forward on those, you know, like to, mm -hmm. to it's just leadership. It just builds leadership. Um, and the more I reflect on, on a classical education, the more I realize that it almost has nothing to do with academics. Okay. Like we're homeschooling and we're doing things but if you're building leadership, um, the academics are just a small part of leadership, right? Like, anyways, so it, it really, like, that's what I'm kind of wrestling with and trying to weigh and sift through is that really a classical education doesn't have near as much to do with academics as it does with just learning and I don't know, build, building that leadership. In building there. the whole person, building the, the leadership in the, you're building the whole, whole person for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So you knew, uh, and, and just fill in a, I think a little gap there with the classical education, you went over the example with your son uh, in English, but that applies, that same model then applies to all the different, I think you could call them strands. Um, mm -hmm where, you know, that's how you're learning math, that's how you're learning science, geography, all those different things. And you're doing the same thing where you're, you're getting the grammar stage and then the uh, dialectic where you're learning to wrestle with truth. And then the rhetoric would be, you're now persuading and teaching others. Did I get that? Did I sum that up somewhat? Yeah. I think my favorite words to describe it, in the Bible it says knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. So when somebody first explained to me the pedagogy of um, grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric, and they used those terms, I thought, well, that seems pretty natural. We put in knowledge, we start to understand, and then we become wise in those things, if we go all the way through. <laughs> but not everybody, I mean, like, that's why public education falls short at the grammar. They don't continue on down the path. Yeah. And something else I would say, too, is really what it does is it cultivates individuals to become lifelong learners. Yes. Right? Because we don't we don't teach to an answer. Right. We teach them how to think through problems and processes so that they can come to their own answer. So you could take an individual who uh, really knows nothing about a subject and they can break it down and then start with that grammar stage. You know, I, I know that I don't know what I don't know. And so you get into that and you start breaking that down as you start to understand that and you start putting those pieces together. And so essentially, um, as we continue to move forward, it basically unlocks the doors to accomplish anything that you really put your mind to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know where to find the information. So, 
Renee, did you, uh, you said you were looking for classical education, so you knew all, uh, at least some of that, what, what classical mm -hmm. education was back then? Yeah, because my friends had talked about it, um, and I had heard how it was organized, how it was structured, different, I had just picked up different pieces here and there, and so I was ready to, like, I knew, okay, so I can see through education. There is not 12 years times nine months worth of math to learn. There is not 12 years times phonics to, you know, expo exposition to learn. And so most homeschool curriculums you buy are a public school model, like compulsory 10, 11, nine, nine or 10 months. Um, do you know, it's like, it's designed to look like school but when you when you get a hold of classical and you realize there's so much freedom within it um you're like yeah i don't want anything that looks like these subjects this many months this many lessons like why are we dividing life up into days you know like it should be milestones and whatever so yeah i knew i didn't know a lot about it i still feel like i'm i'm kind of like turning pages on my understanding of what classical education is, but I definitely was hungry for it. I had heard enough and I was hungry um, and I was looking for it. That's I'm in the same boat. I still, I'm still trying to put pieces together, but it's like, I see, I see what it produces and I see the people it builds and I'm like, that's what I want. So. Right. So I don't want to, I don't want to interrupt your, your narrative, your story. Did you want to continue? Uh, well, I guess we can kind of go back towards um, like how we got into classical conversations or, you know, how that went there. Um, so I was looking for it. You kind of described what it was. But then when I talked to um, a girl who said, I can help you get a group of homeschoolers together that will educate classically, um, I got a hold of the classical conversations catalog that they put out every year. And one statistic kind of stuck out to me a lot. And that was that, and I can't even quote what the number was, but I just knew it was big. It was a big deal. Um, 90 something, 92, 94% of classical conversation students stick with their faith once they leave home. So that was wow. like, whoa, I don't know why it was just really important. And so, you know, parenting and having parented our non-biological children, I'm like for whatever statistics, like, you know, focus on the family set. If you eat dinner together at the table, your kids are less likely to do drugs. I'm like, everybody to the table, <laughs> you know, whatever. Let's like Amen. just pull all the statistics in our favor. You know, what, what do we need to do to be good parents and, and to try to have a lasting Im impact? And so I guess even going into classical conversations, my motive was never like good ACT scores and, you know, all of these academic things. One of the prime motivators for joining classical conversations was that a student will stick with their faith. And so I guess even, you know, eight years ago when we started officially, you know, classically homeschooling with, with um, classical conversations, even the motive then was not to make a smart kid or not to just homeschool or, you know, those things. It was really, this. I guess that's why this period right now is so impactful because we're, we're to the end and she wrestled. I mean, she was spiritually frustrated. She wrestled and she's writing her senior thesis now on man needs to return to their search for God and how the decline of um, society and the decline of humans over time, they continue to search inward towards themselves. And she pulled philosophy. She pulled the Francis Schaeffer, how shall we then live? Mm -hmm. Where it talks about art used to be centered around God and it slowly became about man. And now it's just an expression. If I think a crumply soda can is art, it's art, right? Right. <laughs> so she, she came through that. And, you know, a lot, the classical model teaches you to wrestle with truth, beauty, and goodness. And so I think I can share this. It might shock some people, but I don't, it's fine with me. <laughs> um, Brisa asked me the other day, mom, what do you think of when you think of God? And I said, well, I just watched this Louis Giglio video about God in the space. And so I just keep thinking of like, he's bigger than all the galaxies, you know? And she goes, 
When I was a kid, I used to just think he was this boring old guy that sat between two marble pillars and judged everybody when they didn't do right. <laughs> she's like, it's not that at all, mom. <laughs> so Amen. God is a yeah, real person. And, you Amen. know, how exciting to know, like that whole journey was not about math and science and Latin and homeworks. And, you know, it was like, I think she's going to stick with it when she leaves home. <laughs> Yes. She Praise wrestled God. though, you know, and there was a lot of years where she just, she, she just didn't want anything to do with it. Not that she was in rebellion, but she was like, this is so fake. And I don't, it's not, you know, and so she had to really just dig in, in that, that classical education taught her to wrestle, to ask questions, to, to pursue until she found truth. And so we're like coming up on graduation. So it's kind of like a perfect time for this little podcast because um, it's so exciting to see her come through that, uh, that whole journey. But anyways, so starting to see the, see the fruit of your labors, right? The yes. fruit. Yeah. Actually, we've been seeing bits and pieces of it over the years, just the things that they talk about, the questions that they ask, um, you know, they're not your normal kids, you yeah. know, because of the exposure that they've had to different things. Yeah. Well, and it's, that's so good to have to wrestle with the truth, beauty, and goodness, because they're, they're going to have to at some point. So why would you not prepare them, you know, while the, it's your job to have them in the home? So, yeah, that's one thing I tell my kids is that if any, and in the devotionals downstairs at CC, all the, any truth, beauty, and goodness that people are able to create or find or, or be creative with is it's God's truth, beauty, and goodness. And the reason why, like when we went through art, the reason why the, the modern art is so ugly is because that's all you're left with. Once you reject God, you're, and you're trying to find something new that's not, that's novel, all you're left with is is ugliness because uh, even if some you know a godless artist paints something beautiful that's it's God's and we can appreciate it because it's God's mm -hmm. so uh, I appreciate you sharing how you guys got involved in CC with uh, Renee you're a AR and area representative right that's what that mm -hmm. stands for mm -hmm. with CC would you mind uh, sharing just a little bit about what CC is, uh, yeah, go. Okay, so Classical Conversations is a group um, that meets once a week in your local community. Um, you're given, you know, in the elementary ages, are kind of grouped together in small classes. The parents, um, again, you think you're going to learn math and history and Latin, you're actually going to learn how to homeschool your children. <laughs> like we think that it's a co-op, but it's not a co-op. It's there to equip homeschooling parents. Um, and the mission of classical conversations is to know God and make him known, which is the mm -hmm. end, the end result of where we're going. So, um, parents take their kids once a week. Um, I'm trying to think there's so much I could say. Um, the, the younger, the younger classes spend their time building a foundation. So that program's called foundations. Um, they brick by brick, they put in these little pieces of knowledge. A lot of people get hung up on, we call it memory work. And a lot of people get hung up on the memory work, but you can talk about things if you don't have Absolutely. anything in your head. And so it's an important skill. And not only that, but the skill, like your brain is a muscle. Right. And so the practice of memorizing, um, it just works that muscle so you don't have a brain that's mush. Right. And so even if you don't agree with the content you're memorizing, the skill of memorizing is an important skill. Um, and then as students finish, um, they, they get a little bit older, they join the essentials program. That's probably one of my favorite parts of the classical conversations curriculum is because. I had graduated high school, I had gone into the military, and I had two college degrees. I didn't even know I didn't know how to write a paper. <laughs> I did not know that until I got through essentials. And I was like, 
oh, okay. <laughs> now I know I put words on papers and they were coherent sentences, but I wasn't saying anything, you know? So essentials has like kind of a special place in my heart because I've seen it turn some kids around that had no thoughts upstairs, like nothing going on. I don't know, whatever. Okay. And now they're writing like these beautiful stories. So I really love that. They learn English grammar and English composition. Mm -hmm. And again, we think that that essentials program is the fruit of classical education. And it's still the foundation. We're still building the foundation. And then they go into the challenge program. We have six strands, um, that are six skills or tools that we're trying to teach six skills that we're trying to teach the student. Um, but we use content and subject matter such as biology to teach the skill of research. Um, it's hard to put it into um, like a nice little bow, but anyways, and especially because I've come so far through it, but yeah. Well, what you said there about the essentials, how you, you, found that, you know, I think you said you didn't know how to write a paper. And when you, once you got to essentials, that speaks to something I've heard you say a lot. And I've read in the, the CC and, and then I've seen it in my own life and in my wife's life in classical conversations, you're redeeming two generations at a time mm -hmm. because you're, and you're, like you said earlier, you're building the people, you're building the leadership and that works on two generations at a time mm -hmm. because I, you know, you go through the we believe statements that CC puts at the beginning of all their stuff is we believe the parents can teach their children and should. I, I don't, you probably have that memorized. I probably butchered it, but <laughs> I, don't. I probably should have that memorized. <laughs> but that was the gist of it, wasn't it? That was one of them, right? Yeah. God so. trusts their children and so should we, or God God trusts parents with their children, and so should we, something along those lines. <laughs> that's, that's a lot better, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Fred, you, when I first got into CC, uh, which we've been in it for six years now, we've had our kids. My oldest is in essentials now. Six years. Uh, six years. This is our sixth year, yeah. And uh, when I believe when I started and up until this last year, you were directing a challenge program. Can you share some of uh, what you loved about it and what you learned? Definitely. So I didn't just jump in and start out at the challenge program. Uh, I was actually Renee's first contracted uh, <laughs> tutor for the foundations program. So I spent two years uh, redeeming my elementary education <laughs> for lack of better terms, right? And, uh, you know, the thing that I really enjoy about it, uh, being involved, is that education can be fun. It really can. It doesn't Absolutely. have to be sit down at your desk. It doesn't have to be, okay, everybody be quiet. Everybody sit there and do this assignment. Uh, really, it was an opportunity to enjoy the time with the kids, right? And so once I worked through the, the foundations program, like two years there and our community blossomed almost overnight. Year one, we had uh, six students. And then we doubled up and then we needed challenge programs after that. And that's when Renee had asked me if I would consider stepping into the challenge one arena, uh, which I've done, like you said, for the last several years up until last year. Uh, my work schedule no longer allows it, but I would definitely continue to do it if I could. Uh, the what challenge, was your favorite part? Favorite part of <laughs> challenge one? Yeah. Uh, my favorite part of challenge one is probably when we read the founding documents. Uh, it's part of the curriculum that we get to go through. We're fortunate enough, uh, we get to read the documents like the Declaration of Independence. We go over the Gettysburg Address. We read uh, a lot of the first inaugural addresses. Uh, and we get to work through those and what it meant for America as it was being as it was being built, really. Uh-huh. And you do all that in, in conversation, right? You're not just standing up there talking about it. You guys are having a conversation amongst yes. the students, right? Exactly. So if you're up there lecturing, which is what we're all used to, right, then you're not doing it right. Um, so what it would be, say, for example, reading the Declaration of Independence, we may read it in class 
typically the the program is set up almost like a college prep program to where the students are aware of the assignments the week prior to class. They should already have all the work done. And when they come to class, then they're ready to discuss what they've read and to really digest that. And so that's when we have an opportunity to work through those complex uh, thought processes. Um, and if we get to a point where we're uh, slowing down, I just have to format my questions a little bit differently. Okay. And through classical conversations, we've learned some really great tools, uh, such as what we call the five common topics that we use to discuss these things. And those are definition, comparison, circumstance, relationship, and testimony. And you can use that to work through just about anything. Good. So are you guys doing the founding documents? Are, is that your material for all the different strands? Or is that just one single strand? No, that's just one single strand. Um, that's when we're going through our reasoning. We'll actually read those, digest them, and have a discussion. But the really great thing about this is the challenge one theme is discipline is the cornerstone of freedom, right? So if you are disciplined to do what you need to do, you have all the freedom in the world after that, right? So that's something as far as like being able to hold to appropriate study times. <laughs> getting it's a process <laughs> right so like if you know okay i have school i have chores i have these other things and you do them you're disciplined enough to take care of them when you need to then the rest of the time is yours that's free time mm -hmm. uh, it's like in life as adults you know we go to work we pay our bills we make savings and because of all that we get to go on vacation right you know how it relates <laughs> uh in yes. that capacity <laughs> But the other really great thing about this is, so in challenge one, you have logic, exposition, research, reasoning, debate, right? If you look at CC and the model that they use, those strands are all in an outer circle, okay? Mm -hmm. And at the center is God. Mm -hmm. right? And one of the things that I always had a problem with in modern education is each of those strands were blocked out. It was almost like they were in a box and the boxes don't touch. Very compartmentalized. Exactly. Well, within uh, the challenge program, all of those strands are interwoven. And there's no reason why math doesn't relate to science, doesn't relate to debate, doesn't relate to reasoning, doesn't relate to logic. And so sometimes conversations can go on a rabbit trail, but it's really awesome how God weaves that all together. Mm -hmm. The other th great thing about that is all of those strands point to God and God points to them. Yeah. That's, that's the, the foundational thing really that I would say I, I love about the challenge program. Because you're working out that truth, beauty, and goodness in all of it. That's right. Can yeah. I ask you a question really quick? Sure. I know probably have some things. Have you seen that page in the catalog where it builds up the, the different character traits throughout challenge? No. You should go look at it because that's that's that part where it builds towards leadership, where it's like discipline builds ownership, ownership, you know, and it goes up to the what he's kind of discussing. It's something interesting you might double back and look at. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll check it out. I, I am working through that 2023 catalog right yeah. now, Magalog, whatever you want to call it. I just, I'm also working through the AO binder and the DLG and Someday <laughs> personal when you're books. Just look at that page. It's the page that has like the scope and sequence where it's like challenge. It has all, it's a chart. Anyways, there's these little things that they're trying to teach you in there and it's built into, it's really beautiful, but really what, uh, what did you say? So discipline. discipline is the cornerstone of freedom. That's the theme of challenge one. Mm -hmm. Okay. I believe challenge two goes to freedom, uh, brings choices, and then choices bring consequences. And then I forget. Consequences birth leadership. And oh, is that challenge four? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So it goes. Okay. Cool. Well, that is a, a slight theme of the Mind Your Liberty podcast. I actually talked about that in an episode earlier this year about how. Um, I'm not going to embarrass myself trying to say it in Latin, but there's a Latin <laughs> maxim that he conquers who conquers himself. And yeah, uh, I did embarrass myself on on the podcast, but I did since I've got two people that 
that have been studying Latin for years. I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully I'll be there. Fast forward 10 years, hopefully I'll be able to nail it. But um, I'm working on trying to learn the memory work with my kids. It's a lot easier for them than it is for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, So that actually, I'm going to go ahead and ask it now, uh, Fred, since you mentioned that. This is the Mind Your Liberty podcast, and how would you say education and homeschooling ties into liberty? Education and homeschooling and how it ties into liberty. Well, uh, let's take a look at this, right? Like, liberty is being free to do the things essentially that you want to do, right? Mm -hmm. And homeschooling is kind of uh, a nod to that not playing by somebody else's set of rules. It's us being able to go through and educate our children. Now, with that being said, we also have the freedom to educate our children how we see fit, um, teaching them the subjects that we feel are important, that matter, that will turn them into good, responsible, respectable adults. Leaders. <laughs> it makes leaders. Right. Yeah, we need more of them. And so I've found that in my experience with all the students that have gone through the program, each of them takes on more of a leadership role as they continue to progress. And I've seen it um, as they've gone off to college, as they've gone off to vocational technical schools, and they become leaders within their areas, if that makes any sense. It does. It does. Can I riff off of that for a second? Of course. And, and just thinking out loud here, the... Uh, government education system, so if we're thinking about national liberty, civic liberty, the, the government education system we've talked about is very obedience-oriented. You know, you you yeah. say the thing that they want you to say, you put your time in, you sacrifice your eight hours, whatever the case may be, hopefully not eight hours, but several hours of your life, and you do what you're told to do, you say what you know the the teacher wants you to say, and then that carries on exactly into higher education. So as I'm sure you're aware, most, a lot of the higher education is captured in that same mindset. And then guess what? If you get the two letters after your name, there's probably a job waiting for you in management where you get to do exactly what you're told, make, <laughs> make whitewash it, make it what it needs to be. Right. And, you know, in a, and then you get caught in a, I don't know, a vicious circle of incompetence there once you're in management. And uh, maybe this is a testimonial. The people below you get frustrated. But um, so in terms of civic liberty, bringing it back to that, w building leaders where you're actually being trained not to just do the thing, but to do the right thing. You're learning virtue and studying truth, beauty, and goodness, and you're taking initiative. Like my kids in foundations, Davey at uh, you know, his young age is giving presentations. Now it might just be about this new toy he got or something like that, but he's standing up in front of the class and giving presentations. And he's, that's all the kids in foundations do that every week. And when they get to essentials and they present their papers and they're uh, and then in challenge, they're given feedback Thanks. on their presentations, right? There's a, I remember Karen always says the glows and grows, grow, glows and grows. Thank you. Yeah. What, what did you do good and what can you do better next time? Right. And they're also learning how to give that. And those are all such vital leadership uh and I would just say people skills. But uh, so when you get to the civic leader, you know, you were producing leaders now that can maybe not just do what the state tells them to do. You know, the, the public education, government education is built to create good citizens in terms of just stick to your little corner and do your thing. Mm -hmm. And and the. Uh, I guess what we're what we're doing here in classical Christian education in builds people who are able to break away from that. Yeah. So if I can jump on that real quick, yeah. uh, maybe I'm 
going to jump ahead and sorry if I steal <laughs> this from you. Uh, but one of the great books that we read when we were first starting this process is called A Thomas Jefferson Education. It is a great book and it talks about exactly what you had mentioned, how, you know, kids, you know, and I'll <clears throat> try to sum it up as best I can. It's been a while, um, but our education is almost modeled like a conveyor belt. Everybody steps onto the conveyor belt at the same place at the same time. And the conveyor belt is supposed to move at the same rate of speed. And everybody learns all of the same things as they go along. Right. Mm -hmm. Think about it <clears throat> as you go back for a long time. America was in that industrial age before we stepped into the uh, information age, right? And so people were working in factories. And what do we need? We need no offense to the people that do this. I don't mean that. And I've worked a factory job, but you're essentially a mindless automaton. You go in, you punch the clock, you do your repetitive task over and over again. At the end of the day, you punch the clock, you go home, you come back, you do it over and over again. That is essentially what the modern education has set us up to do. One of the struggles with that as well is there's very little room for outside development uh, as far as being able to move ahead or, uh, you know, some students may need to slow down. Mm -hmm. uh, like we talked about earlier, grasping those foundational concepts, the conveyor belt just continues to move them along and it's just filling holes. Um, one of the great things about class classical conversations about classical learning in general and homeschooling is if we think outside of the box. So I listen to a lot of podcasts and one that I was listening to earlier today um, had a former Navy SEAL on it and he wrote a book. Um, I think it's called The Attributes. There are 25 of them and how they pertain to leadership. Well, on the podcast he was speaking to, one of the things that he brought about is, okay, let's say you're in a situation and you need to make a decision. You need to stop and ask yourself, one, what are the rules or boundaries as they apply to the situation? Then you stop and you ask yourself the second question, are these rules or boundaries real or are they perceived? And then the third question is, okay, if these rules or boundaries are real, what are the consequences if I break them, right? <laughs> Because, That's my question. <laughs> because let's face it, some rules are just silly rules. Some rules can be bent and some rules can be broken with little to no consequences. And to go along with that, within the classical model, that's what we're learning is how to think outside of that box. You know, you've mm -hmm. learned to solve a problem uh, in the A method, but has anybody ever considered this B method? It may be better. Mm -hmm. It may be more efficient. It may be more effective. Um, and so that helps us step off of that conveyor belt. That's good. I mean, That's good. It makes me laugh because I deal with a lot of conflict and people are like, it's either this or this. And I'm like, there's like 20 other options. We could, <laughs> you know, but a lot of people just get stuck in that. Right. And that speaks to in. In regards to the question, how does this tie into liberty? Thinking outside of the box, giving yourself that ability to think outside the box, that gives you agency, right? The ability to determine your own uh, your own outcomes, your own issues and future. And it really is empowering to an individual. And if, if they're leaders, then that's freeing for other people too. Mm -hmm. and, and that goes back to our American heritage, right? When, yes. Uh, when the colonials were taxing us and we had no representation and any say in anything that we did, there were a lot of people who actually did not want to go to war uh, and do that. But there were key individuals, leaders who said, this is not right. This is not fair. We're going to stand up for it. Uh, and they stepped out uh, again on faith, right? That they right. were doing the right thing. Yeah, and that was what was matter. That's what mattered. Is this is unjust? This is unjust, and we're going to do what's right. And that's that's another theme. I eventually I've got all these podcasts I'd love to do. I just don't have time to put them together. But uh, 
at least I'm going to, I'm going to have some merch at some point. That's one of my goals this year. I shared in a podcast episode was to start monetizing some of these quotes. And one of them that I love that I just keep going back to, uh, is duty is ours. Results are God's, you know, it's up to us to do what's right and let God have the rest. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I wanted to be considerate of your time, and we're reaching the end of our time limit here. So thank you for your time. Did you have a resource recommendation, or was that that, that Thomas Jefferson education? Uh, well, We have three. We could, we go, were, for, go for it. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson education is one of my favorites. Um, if, you want, if you want to think outside the box, it tells you how to get off the conveyor belt and, and consider other things. Um, you can tell yours, and then I'll tell the last one. Okay. So I am a huge Jocko Willink fan. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's a former Navy SEAL. Uh, I've seen him on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so he has a lot of great resources out there. Um, extreme ownership, uh, the dichotomy of leadership, leadership tactics and strategies. And he basically breaks it all down for you. Uh, mm-hmm. Leadership is actually a skill that can be learned. It's not a natural born trait necessarily. Okay. And they have a kid's book called. Yeah, The Way of the Warrior Kid. So that's really fun because that kind of segues into the last thing I'm going to tell you because I think you'll like this one too. Um, There's a new company out called Brave Books and they put out a monthly book subscription. Um, So Michael's getting these books and they kind of contradict modern thoughts. I don't really know how to put it politically correct. But anyways, um, the Brave books are really fun uh, that he gets every month. And so we're building that that thinking into him young. So Cool. Excellent. That's kind of similar to the, uh, the Tuttle Twin books. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, really similar. Yeah. Cool. So. Well, I'll check it out. Are the Brave books out of the publishing house from Jocko Willink? No. 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 Okay. Different publishers. Okay. Really well, neat. Well, so. Mm-hmm. Well, I will certainly check it out. I've got one of Jock, the Extreme Ownership book is actually on my reading list. Uh, it's in, it's queued up in my audio books. So thanks for those recommendations. And for the audience, I encourage you to check those out. So thanks thanks for your time, uh, Fred and Renee. I really appreciate your time. I think this has been a conversation that, again, shares your story and will hopefully inspire people to explore some of these options. And I, I've wanted to have the conversation for a while. So thanks for taking the time to do it. Thank Thank you you. for having us. All right, that's the conversation. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're able to learn something, to glean something from it. If it was beneficial, if it was something you would recommend, if you would, just hit the like button on whatever platform you're on. Send it to somebody you think would enjoy it, needs to learn something about this. Listen, all we can do is mind our own liberty here. And if if we've got family, if you've got kids, make sure you're bringing them up. In the nurture and admonition of the Lord, make sure you're teaching them a biblical, rigorous worldview so they can uh, withstand the wiles of the devil. If you're a father, if you're a mother out there, you really do have so much uh, impact on the world through your kids. If you don't have kids yet, maybe these have given you things to think about so when you do get there. And if you've already had kids in the past, then you can share it and tell someone else about it because so much has opened up in the homeschooling arena over the past 30 years from the time when I was homeschooled to where it is now. It's just a different world. Thank the Lord for it. I am privileged. I am grateful to live in this country and specifically even the state of Missouri where it is uh, very free. We were given a lot of liberty in that area. So I will go ahead and make the resources that they recommended available. I'll link to them in the description of this podcast. I don't have any affiliates set up at this point. I'm not making any money. I just want to spread resources. Like I said in the conversation, I love it when people recommend resources. I always find new podcasts, new books to read, something like that. So hopefully I can be a blessing to you that way. Also, if you want to find out more about Classical Conversations, you can go to classicalconversations.com. Or if you'd like, you can email me at mindyourliberty at gmail.com. I'd be happy to get you some more information. And then as I leave the founders off, I just, I, I miss them. And so I'm going to share just a quote with you here from Dr. Benjamin Rush, physician in founding colonial era of the United States. He had some wacky views on some things. I can't fully endorse him, but 
he has a good quote here, and he was very in influential in the revolution and leading up to it. And if you remember, he was influential, actually, in getting Dr. John Witherspoon into the colonies. If you don't know who John Witherspoon is, go back to my very first episode in January of 2021. And listen to his sermon. It's fantastic. So the quote here from Dr. Benjamin Rush about education, the only foundation for a useful education in a republic is to be laid in religion. Without this, there can be no virtue, and without virtue, there can be no liberty, and liberty is the object of life of all Republican governments. So Dr. Rush certainly had a handle on that concept, and again, we're training the whole person. That's what God does, because we're spiritual beings with a body. So I don't want to talk any more than I already have. I just want to leave you with that and encourage you, until next time, to mind your liberty. Think about it, care about it, defend it as you ought, mind your liberty.